So hello to everybody who's online today. Thanks for joining us. Um, we appreciate it. Um, Daniel, can you hit me on the next slide? Thank you. Um, as you all know, you've logged on to AAF Orlando's presentation for today. And uh, we're a member of the uh, American Advertising Federation's fourth district that encompasses the entire state of Florida and the Caribbean. We're one of the larger districts in the fact that we have a lot of clubs. Um, so we're very active, very uh, important AAF district. Uh, we have two organizations. We have AAF Orlando for the, I don't know, the seasoned marketing professionals. And then we have Add to Orlando for the up and coming marketing professionals. Um, and then our slogan, one of our slogans, if you're in business, then you're in advertising. So we're a little bit behind the curtain as far as uh, what, what the general public thinks about advertising and creative firms. Um, but certainly we work with every major industry um, and with all kinds of businesses, large and small throughout our industry. So we play a very important role in the national economy and here in Orlando and Central Florida, we play a very important role in our economy as well. We wanna have a special thank you, of course, to our sponsors uh, who are just great partners for us. So Push Button Creative Audio, Yash and John, always willing to work with us and do a lot for AAF Orlando and have been very active throughout the years with AAF. Uh, Concrete Lion Pictures, um, if you have uh, any video production needs, please give them uh, consideration. Adrenaline Films, the same thing. Great video production company. Outfront Media for your out of home advertising needs. And MP the PR Breakthrough Boot Camp from AMPR for anybody who wants to get a, uh, a lot of information and knowledge quickly about PR and how it works. Thanks, sponsors. All right, so today our presentation is from Mitchell Smith. Mitchell is the Advanced Advertising Sales Manager for Spectrum Reach, and his topic today is Reaching Consumers Across Screens, the Convergence of TV, OTT, and Digital Video. Um, so we all know that those are important uh, tactics for all of us today for serving up advertising. Um, so today, Mitchell's going to talk a little bit about helping us determine why OTT viewership's on the rise and what we need to do to address that audience, um, understand why effective marketing campaigns depend on the quality of the data, which of course comes into play with almost every single thing we do these days, and to know how to recognize current shifts in the market and to try to be prepared for what's coming up next. So with all of that said, Mitchell, thank you very much again for today, and we're going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. That's good. Well, thank you very much, Terry. I appreciate you. I appreciate that introduction and appreciate being here. Um, to everyone else, um, as Terry said, my name is Mitchell Smith. I'm an advanced advertising sales manager at Spectrum Reach. And if you're not familiar with Spectrum Reach, we're the advertising division of Spectrum, the country's second largest internet company. Uh, we have over 30 million customers across the country that depend on us for internet video and mobile services, including small and medium-sized businesses. And we're proud to work with American Advertising Federation of Orlando. Our mission is to help local advertisers grow their business by getting their message out on TV, streaming, and online to anyone, anywhere. Well, thank you again for attending and choosing to spend your time with me today. And let's get started having our conversation on the convergence of video. Now, the world has changed exponentially for all of us these past few months. Every business has had to make some tough decisions. And for the um, marketers out there, we know that you're taking a closer look at all of your advertising efforts to ensure that you're making an impact to the bottom line. Driving measurable results is more important than ever. The pace is so rapid lately, it's sometimes hard to keep up, just hard and challenging just to keep up with everything that's going on. Um, we have the increase in connected devices um, has changed the definition of TV entirely. Uh, streaming wars are heating up with all the new subscription on demand and ad supported video apps that have launched just within the last year. Then there's the rise in time spent online as more people are working from home 
and families are managing how to, to you know, do the virtual learning. <laughs> Today, I'm looking to share some ideas on how you can plan, execute, and measure your video campaigns with a whole, more holistic approach across all the screens. Hey, Mitchell, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh -huh. uh, I forgot, of course, I forgot a couple things. Um, to everybody who's attending and listening, if you have any questions at all, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll probably um, get to those after instead of, we'll let Mitchell go ahead through his presentation. So as you come across slides or ideas and you have a question or a comment, please go ahead and put that in the chat and we'll get to those right afterwards. And then one more thing uh, for, for one of our lucky attendees today, um, thank you, Spectrum Reach, for providing an Apple TV. So we're going to do a little bit of a raffle at the end, and uh, and I'll get in touch with with the winner, and uh, you'll get yourself a nice Apple TV. So sorry. All right, Mitchell, I apologize. Please no, keep going. That's totally fine. At least I know I, that will hold everybody's attention till the end. If nothing else, the Apple TV will keep everybody where they are. <laughs> so, but no, that's totally fine. And, and great point. Uh, they have those questions in there. So um, this afternoon, I'm going to start by walking you through uh, four distinct and important inflection points in today's media world. Then I'm going to leave you with actionable takeaways to help you adapt your media strategies and increase impact and effectiveness. First, what we know for sure now more than ever is that TV is content, not the hardware that we consume it on. Viewers are seeking news, entertainment, and sports that are viewable on any screen, large or small. And at any time, in fact, as the delivery of content over the internet becomes uh, the new norm, the line between traditional linear TV and streaming TV programming will only continue to blur. As the slide demonstrates, we can no longer define TV as a set in the room. To viewers, it's anything they can watch anywhere and on any device, from the smallest of phones to the biggest flat screen TVs. And what's even more incredible is for some, the, those smartphones that they're using are actually cost more than a good sized smart TV. Second, the concept of appointment viewing has completely changed. Outside of live sports and newsworthy events, viewers say it's important to them to be able to watch their shows and movies whenever they want. And with streaming TV, they're watching all hours of the day and night and across all types of screens and devices. All of this video to watch across screens and across device is great for viewers, but the audience fragmentation is really challenging for advertisers and the market and to marketers. Um, I'll walk you through what you need to keep in mind as you develop your marketing plans. And third, buying advertising just shouldn't be a guessing game anymore. Using an aggregated and anonymized data-driven approach can um, help you reduce waste and make your dollars go further. And with the increase in online viewing across device, traditional TV advertising strategies need to adapt. By moving from a ratings-driven approach to impression-based buying, TV and digital can be planned together, not separately. Advertisers, advertisers demand immediate feedback about their ad performance. And this is where dig, digital is transforming the whole look of TV. With the increase in online viewing across device, traditional TV advertising strategies need to adapt by moving from, as I said, a ratings-driven approach to impression-based buying, targeting up to a type of targeting because that makes it a lot more impactful. Marketers can deliver a one-to-one -one impression to the consumers that they want to reach based off of their interests, their attitudes, and the purchase behaviors. So in order to drive more impactful campaigns, we have to break down the silos between our media strategy and planning teams. If you work for an agency, you probably have an idea of what I'm about to say, <laughs> because I was in a, a meeting recently at an agency and I met with the digital team, which was separate from the media team. That type, that thinking is not going to be sustainable. We're confusing consumers if we have different branding messages and creative strategies for every platform. And now that TV looks more digital with OTT, um, it's bringing the two together now. It's a time to create that synergy as opposed to working independently. Which brings us to number four, to the audience. The, con the content in the center is the center of attention, not the device or the app. They are seamlessly moving from a connected TV to apps to websites to find their fa favorite TV programming. For advertisers um, that think that this, uh, that don't think of this holistically, that thinking again has to change because it's not a matter of either or. They're doing all of this stuff seamlessly, as I said. 
Understanding that all video platforms complement each other is key. If you focus on your audience first, you can then figure out how to build your cross-platform video strategy. Telling a, a consistent story across TV, streaming, and online and social is where you can drive the most conversion. Now, o OTT can help you extend the reach of TV campaigns and deliver households that may have been underexposed or missed completely by solely using traditional TV as the media. Campaigns that utilize both linear TV and streaming enjoy a brand favorability increase of more than double that of an OTT only plan. Let me use an example. <clears throat> a breakfast restaurant wants to build a brand recognition to let consumers know that they have launched curbside pickup to make you know, them feel better about dining out as opposed to dining in. Using aggregated and anonymized data, they can target them while streaming on their smart TVs and then follow them online for next day exposure. To drive conversion, the business can deliver specific conversion-based ads on mobile devices to provide coupons or other special offers for their next visit. Sale conversions will benefit and will be amplified by, by these branding type of branding campaigns. Now that I've laid some groundwork for our discussion today, here are a few things to keep in mind as you begin to build your plan. It's critical that we think of ourselves as consumers, not just marketers. Our campaign strategy should, not, should reflect changes in consumer behavior, especially considering how COVID has accelerated some of these trends that we've seen lately. More time spent online, viewership of streaming platforms is increasing, and a greater focus on humanizing your brand and telling better stories. And all of this is hinged on the ability to use video effectively. And I want to leave you with some practical ways to apply this knowledge day to day and make sure you can get started with effective cross-platform media planning when you leave here. I want to walk you through some practical ways to apply this knowledge in your day-to-day -day routine to make sure you can get started and build an effective cross-platform media strategies when you leave. Let's start at the beginning. Often clients come to us with big ideas or creative concepts, and that's great, but it's important to bring everything back to the basics. What is your goal? It's our job to help our clients succeed and not just give them what they want, but actually work with them to give them what they need. First and foremost, most companies, no matter how big or small, need to raise brand awareness and recognition. I get it, brand awareness can sound cliche, and I know that you know, for us digital marketers, it's all about the conversions, and that's absolutely true. But remember, you know, if consumers don't recognize and trust your brand, it's less likely that they're gonna buy from you. And this has been proven, especially now through the COVID pandemic, whether that's reminding people that your business is open, that, they're taking, that you're taking safety precautions and making sure that, the place, that your place of business is cleaned regularly, or just that you're supporting the local community. All of that has to happen and it can be effective, but it still has to stem from you identifying what your overall goal is. And that might be for some real ed retailers wanting to boost online sales as you know, e-commerce e is starting to boom. It could be restaurants and beverage companies driving curbside pickup in partnerships with food delivery services. It could even be auto dealers letting customers know that they can come in store or that they can deliver the car to their home or their place of business. Being clear about the goals and how you want to measure those results is your ultimate first step. Okay, now that you have your goals in mind, it's vital to define the target audience you wanna reach. Understanding your target audience and their relationship with various media channels is very, very, very important. Focusing on the audience first will support the development of creating messaging that will resonate with them, but also determine how you select your media mix and find the right partner to work with. When you think about your video strategy, advertisers can now leverage aggregated and anonymized first party viewership data to make informed decisions about their campaign objectives. One benefit that we provide our clients at Spectrum Reach is that we can provide insights based on aggregated and anonymized data from billions of streaming sessions across our household. What networks or programs are, are they watching? Are they watching at home on a connected TV or a mobile device? When are they watching during the day? And who watches TV the most based on the household makeup? Uh, is it the homeowners? Um, is it homes with families? Or is it the households that own a Toyota versus a Lexus? These insights help us uh, and help our marketers identify the best audience and how to reach that target audience best. 
As you look at this slide, realize you can also leverage your own data to match against aggregated and anonymized first party viewership data uh, to make an even more informed decision about your targeting strategy. Who is already using your product or service and what do they look like? Who's buying from the competition and how do you turn them into a fan of your business? Where do they live? How much money does the current customer have to spend? What do, like, what do they like to do in their own spare time? And what, at what stage in life are they? All of this is relevant and important information. Combining insights from your own aggregated and anonymized first party data with data from your partners can help you to make a smarter decision in your purchasing. Okay, now that you've defined the goals and the metrics and you've used the data strategy to identify the audience you wanna reach, it's time to define the media mix and the rationale behind it. As you begin to build out your video, uh, your video plan, here are some good things to keep in mind. People are spending more than five hours a day with video on different platforms. And we've even, and that's even been accelerated due to COVID. Adults 18 plus are still spending more than eight hours a day with traditional TV, but that's definitely seeing, you know, year over year declines. And that's directly related to more time being spent on connected TV and other mobile devices. According to Nielsen, approximately 75% of US homes uh, have an internet enabled connected TV device and access to some form of subscription and streaming service. One last thing to keep in mind, as you look at younger versus older consumers, adults 18 to 34 spend almost half their connected media time on phones. Your video strategy for younger audiences should be very different when you consider the mix of OTT, online video, and social. Okay, let's break some of this down real quick. We've talked about your audience and the data tools that are you know, at, your, at our disposal. Before we talk about who we should be partnering with on our streaming TV buys, I just wanted to provide, provide a baseline understanding of what streaming space is at a very high level. There are essentially four main types of streaming providers. Uh, first would be pay TV. At the end of Q1, pay TV subscribers represented approximately 70% of house, uh, TV households in the US. While cord cutting is definitely on the rise, all of these companies like Spectrum, Comcast, AT&T, and others have streaming options of their own for their customers. It can be part of their set-top box on-demand or their proprietary apps that viewers can use to stream their favorite live and on-demand shows. There's also data that shows that not only are paid TV homes just watching their paid TV services, but also stacking other streaming apps to complement their TV viewing. In fact, 73% of US TV homes subscribe to at least one OTT service showing that there's more cord stacking going on than just cord cutting. Second is virtual pay TV, V pay, which is you know, VOD. Then you have, um, and that's usually incorporated with traditional TV channels. Uh, the air, they air the same network programming that you're currently watching on live TV. It's just delivered via the internet through uh, a non corded device. Um, like traditional pay TV, these are also fully ad supported and give advertisers an enormous opportunity to reach and engage the audience wherever and whenever they choose to watch content. In 2020, eMarketer forecasts that up to 10 million US TV households in the US will subscribe to internet uh, only virtual pay TV service. With both pay TV and virtual subscriptions, that would make up almost 78% of all US TV homes and a major streaming opportunity uh, for local marketers. When it comes to streaming video on demand, these are the major players. Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Hulu have all been around for about 10 or more years. All three continue to build on their vast libraries of original and licensed film and TV content in order to retain and gain new subscribers in both the US and internationally. The so-called streaming wars heated up last year with the launches of Apple TV Plus and Disney Plus, giving consumers even more choices when it comes to streaming services. And, it not, and it's not slowing down by any indication. This year has brought the launch of Discovery Plus, HBO Max, and Peacock. For now, when it comes to ad-supported options though, Hulu is dominant, and that's mainly because most of the largest subscription VOD platforms have very limited or no um, advertising options for marketers, like Netflix. They have the largest subscri subscriber base of any of the VOD platforms, but you can't place local content, um, no local ads within their content. For viewers looking for the most cost-effective ways to enjoy a large library of movies and TV shows, there are now multiple streaming services that distinguish themselves by offering thousands of hours of free TV and film content. 
since all the services that fall within this category are free to subscribers, they are largely ad-supported video on demand, or AVOD. This is great for consumers because it provides them a way to get free video. <laughs> and while they may not include some of the high profile exclusive original content that you would find on like Netflix or Disney Plus, there's still a lot of stuff to watch. For advertisers, especially local businesses, they provide a great way to connect with audiences that may not, they may not reach through regular pay TV or subscription VOD platforms, but it's still within the OTT space and the connected TV environment. Now, there are a couple of things to keep in mind when you're evaluating where to get started in buying OTT. Between you, the advertiser, and the type of content you want this to be associated with, there are three top line ways that you can buy streaming advertising. One, you can go direct to a publisher or media partner that exclusive, has exclusive inventory that you probably won't find through any programmatic marketplace. This will encompass both live and on-demand ad inventory and usually higher profile programming, which in turn may lead to higher CPMs. But if you want the best, you'll definitely have to pay to play. Secondly, you can work with a media partner or demand side platform. You've probably heard of this as a DSP to acquire inventory from a private marketplace or a PMP. These companies usually have direct partnerships with some of the top programmers. And like going through, going direct, you can give, you know, it gives you the opportunity to get some more high profile placement. Uh, one of the things to remember though, is that not all private marketplaces are created the same. And if you want specific um, publications and programming, then you wanna make sure that your media partner is providing transparency on how exactly they, and what exactly they have access to. Lastly, you can buy via DSP on your own and uh, source private inventory through uh, various ad exchanges. This can make for easy execution, but um, you can go, you can, that makes it, it makes it easier to access inventory because you can go and get it yourself and through different pro, um, platforms and aggregators but you, know, you wanna keep something in mind that this is an auction-based format. And although it gives you these impressions and access at a very low cost, one of the things you need to be aware of is that you know, it doesn't always protect you from um, or restrict any type of ad fraud that may ex um, you may experience. And then it's uh, also remember that you know, just because you think you're getting this high placement on premium content doesn't necessarily mean that's actually what's happening. So you wanna make sure you're checking that to make sure your ads are running where you think they are. So the next thing you'll want to develop is messaging that aligns with each platform. Consistency is vital. For example, a 30 second video allows for storytelling, whereas a search or a banner ad can help reinforce the message to drive activation. That 30 second commercial that you have for TV can be used on OTT as well, but I wouldn't recommend it for desktop or especially mobile video ads. Having different versions for various formats is fine, but make sure that the overall brand message and call to action are aligned in an overarching strategy. As you build your media rationale, explain why each medium, TV, OTT, or digital video makes sense on the objectives that you set forth in the beginning, understanding your goal. So at this point, you've done the groundwork and performed the due diligence. Uh, you set your goals, identified your audience, you've aligned with your client or marketing manager, and you've made practical decisions about budget and scale. Now you're ready to activate the strategy. As you plan your execution strategy, there are a few things to think about when you're um, setting up your campaign. Does your media partner offer the ability to place third-party tags or verification and various attribution capabilities? Uh, can your partner guarantee that your ads are being seen in a brand safe and fraud free environment? Brand relevancy is critical and you always want to make sure you, you aren't wasting a single dollar. And then there's transparency. That is required. What kind of reporting does your media partner provide you so that you can be sure your ads are running, not only in the right geography, but within the platforms and the apps that align with you know, the audience that you're trying to reach? Once your campaign begins, uh, once it starts running, data will start coming in almost immediately. But it's important to give your campaign time to generate response and reach a critical mass um, with consumers. Keeping your end goal in mind and learning along the way, paired with a little bit of patience, <laughs> will go a long way in helping you measure the results of your campaign. Now, as I close out today, I'd like to show you a quick qu uh, client example. We had a grocery client that have been, um, steady, have been a steady advertiser running with us with uh, linear TV and also with streaming for, for a few years. 
we shared with them that due to COVID, we saw a significant increase in streaming viewing. Because, because of what we saw, they increased their spend in streaming to complement what they were buying on with their regular TV. They had a broad audience target in order to reach as many people as possible, but they also wanted to target families as well as promote their weekly specials and promotions. The results were outstanding. We were able to show the client that with their streaming campaign, they were able to achieve a 52% lift in unique audience reach. 52% more households were exposed to the ad via streaming that they never would have seen had they not been on the streaming platform. This is just an excellent way of showing how you can use streaming along with data to generate greater exposure. Now, I really hope this presentation provided some practical learnings as you know, you look to incorporate streaming advertising into your media mix. Um, let's try to break down those barriers between traditional media and digital and take advantage of this exciting time in media. And as I'm sure we're all aware of, there are even more changes to come as we move forward. Uh, we will now start the Q&A, and I'm excited to hear the questions that you have uh, for me going forward. Mitchell, thank you very much for that. Um, that's a, that was a, a lot of very useful information. And uh, obviously, even in, in, in all advertising these days, there are a lot of components and a lot of tactics uh, that you can you need to consider and, and choose. So we appreciate you laying all that out in a, in a nice, easy to follow format for sure. You're welcome. So I, I guess, you know, these are just a couple of questions here and, and you addressed this already. I'll do the, the big general one first, right? I was wondering, is there such a thing as a traditional TV viewer any longer, you know? And you, you had the slide where you said that definitely on the decline um, and I'm not even sure what the definition of a traditional TV viewer even is anymore, right? Right, and, and really it's, um, I always say there's, TV viewing is kind of gone. It's, it's content consumption is what it has basically come to. How do you choose to consume the content you, you wanna watch? You know, my wife and daughter, it happens on their phone or a tablet. They're always watching some type of video or something like that, uh, programming and things. It, it's very different. The mindset is different. I mean, even my mother, who is definitely on the opposite end of the spectrum now, doesn't care. She'll pull out her phone. She has her apps that I've downloaded on there. So if she's out and about and doing whatever, she can pull out her phone and, and watch and catch her own programming. So, you know, the concept behind TV is so different now. I think the way we have to think about it is, you know, how do I get my content in front of the right people whenever they choose to consume? Yeah. And, you know, obviously success for, you know, all marketing these days and, and you, you know, for digital marketing, even, even non-digital, non but for, for your OTT and, and, uh, and digital uh, is based on data, right? On mm -hmm. audience sets, right? Audience subsets um, exactly. and how those are served up um, behind the scenes kind of thing. So just wondering, you know, if you know of any effects, like there's a, there's a, some proposed upcoming privacy law changes, right? Um, yes. Where a good amount of data comes from. And then, you know, Google uh, has said that they're going to, they're going to change their data collection policies as well. So there's a lot of talk right now, you know, with big, big marketers and big, big brands have their own first party data, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, they've, because their, their, their organizations are huge, they've been able to amass um, proprietary customer data of their own. But for a lot of us, you know, and, and agencies also, we don't have that, really have that luxury. Mm -hmm. So do you have any viewpoint on how those might uh, come into play here? Yeah, um, what you're gonna see is a lot, a lot of companies trying to partner more and more with people who can generate their own first and second, second party data. Third party will have its place, but it won't be nearly as popular as it is now, simply because of what you said with GDPR and you know with the California laws and the new I iOS 14.5 that just released. I mean, it, the security across uh, the internet is going to tighten up. We all know we all know it's, it was going to happen at some point. It has to. Uh, what it looks like and how, what it evolves into is what we're waiting for. Even with all of these changes, people are finding ways and other. Um, I guess, uh, tactics to, to, to get information, be it lookalike 
audience is or having, like you said, having your own first party data. But the companies that can generate their own first party data that in volume are the ones that are going to do the best. And, you know, whereas some companies didn't choose to partner with others at some point, that's going to have to change because getting people, we for so long, we've had these conversations about getting the right message in front of the right person at the right time. You know, I always tell the AEs that I work with, everybody used to say, oh, I got to be on this website. When it first started out, I got to be on that website. You know, we got to cover this. We got to get impressions there because that's where people are. Well, those days are gone. That doesn't matter anymore. I always say, use the, I use this example of, of a phone. This is what this is really going to break down to. And because if you and I were communicating and you wanted to reach me, you knew I, I was who you want to talk to and you call me, what you really want is for me to pick up the phone. Does it matter if I'm in the grocery store at that moment, if I'm at work at that moment, if I'm home, if I'm at the park with my daughter? It doesn't matter. You just, you just want me to pick up the phone. You have no understanding of what I'm doing. You just want me to pick up the phone. And when I pick up the phone, the conversation can begin. Advertising is very much that same thing. You just want people to pick up the phone when you call, whether they're, whatever they may be doing, whatever site they may be on, whatever app they're within, that's what you want. We've gotten people used to that. So to go to a point now where you're going to say, well, it's going to be kind of low. We can find somebody who looks like him. We can find somebody who has those same type of behaviors, but you can't deliver that person per se. That's going to be a hard pill for people to swallow sometimes. So now it's going to be very, very important to make sure you're working with vendors that have that ability to still you know, provide you with that targeting that you need to be very precise. Because like I said, nobody wants to waste money. We've gotten away from that. And that's been a key point. So if you start to now backtrack and start to say, well, we can get kind of close. You know, a lot of advertisers aren't really trying to hear that from us. Yeah, that's that's a, a great way to describe it with the with when you call someone direct on the phone, right? And so that speaks to to one to one mm -hmm. marketing, right? Which is exactly you know the the you know became the goal, right? In the old days, right? I, I don't I think it was John Wanamaker maybe who said way back in the day. I know that fifty percent of my advertising budget works. <laughs> I just don't know which fifty percent that doesn't. <laughs> That doesn't apply anymore. And that's old, yeah. old, old schools. And like you say, no brand wants to hear that any longer because everybody knows um, about all the data that's available and, and digital media is very specific and targeted, but here we go. So here we go through a, you know, nothing stays the same. So we have a little yeah. round of change that we have to yeah. navigate. Yeah, and, and I was saying with, with just this week, I think it was Tuesday or Monday night, the iOS 14.5 that released. And, you know, everybody's kind of waiting to see. And I told, you know, everybody I talked to, I told them, like, look, the first 30 to 60 days, you're probably not going to see a big change. I mean, most of the people know it was coming. They're trying to figure it out. But everybody's going to wait to see how it does this really affect me. How, how big of a hit am I taking here? Because all, of, all we're hearing is estimated. We, we estimate one to 20% of people may choose to opt in to be able to track and get that information. We don't know. We, we just have to, you know, wait and see what happens. So for the first 30 to 60 days, most agencies and businesses are going to say, all right, well, what is this? How is this really going to affect me? And then once they get that information and they understand, all right, this is what this means, they're going to look to have some alternative if, they, if it does really have that negative effect, which I think it will because Google and Facebook aren't, you know, freaking out for nothing you know right. they don't yeah, just yeah. all of a sudden get you know get antsy and start creating all these other things because something's going to have a minimal effect on them no it's i think it's going to have an effect but i think most people are in that mode of i will react to what happens as opposed to being proactive and preparing for what i think is going to happen so there'll be uh, some people that are ahead of the curve but most people are going to wait to see how how impactful this is and, and how it affects their business and then they'll look for those resources outside of that yeah, interesting, right? A more practical kind of kind of approach, right? Let's keep this campaign going and see what happens, mm -hmm. and and see what if we get a drop off or not get a drop off, right? Because certainly yep. there's a lot of other data sources out there, but online behavior is a big one, you know. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, I think that's that's it for today so thank you again mitchell for for your time and your brain power today we really enjoyed it yeah 
Yeah, and thank you everybody who, uh, who attended today. And I'm sure you guys have got a, a lot out of this. Um, and please look for uh, upcoming AAF Orlando programs and events. If you haven't already, please follow us on our social pages, Facebook and Instagram. You can visit our website, aaf-orlando.org and sign up for our email newsletter. Um, so just keep up with, with all our happenings. We would love to see you attending all of our programs. And if you haven't in the past and you do want to, please get involved with us. We're always looking for good, smart people to join us and, and join our committees and make the club even stronger. Um, I'm going to steal the John F. Kennedy, ask not what AAF Orlando can do for you, but please ask what you can do for AAF Orlando, because when we have great membership and we have great participation from members, it really does make the organization stronger and makes our creative community stronger and better. So thanks for considering that and thanks for attending today. Mitchell, thank you very much again. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Enjoy. All right. All right, everybody take care.